more adults. And it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, it kind of went like ours did. We got about two and a half pages done. Because we got deep in the conversation and we didn't get all the way through the whole week. So it's nice to know that we're not the only ones that don't get all seven days done sometimes when you do it. But the conversation was good and the whole gist of it, the outcome was awesome. So, welcome everybody. Oh, the roots of Abraham. Okay? If I say Abraham, if I say Abram, does anybody even know who I'm talking about? Yep. Mmm. How come? Because I was in the fourth. Huh? That was his, his birth name. Oh! Before he got the. Right. Oh. And. Oh. Where was he headed in this week's chapter? Where was he headed? But he didn't know where he was headed. <laughs> yeah. He kind of got stalled on the way to nowhere, right? Well, God told him to leave, you know. Yeah, I told him to leave. You know, when I graduated high school, God didn't tell me to leave. I told me, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. Probably wasn't the brightest thing in the book right then, but I did go away to college for one semester. And then I said, I'm leaving. And I had a job, and that lasted a week and a half. And they said, you're leaving. And I said, uh oh, now what? So we always think we have the better plan. In actuality, do we have the better plan? No. no. Had I paid attention and had I read more prayer and more spiritual in my younger life, I probably would have saved myself a lot. Abraham, which I'm going to skip to the new name, Abraham was always on the move. He was a migrant worker. Think about that. I spent three years in the lettuce. I was a migrant worker. I made good money, but I was moving six times a year. Yeah, fruit tramp, produce tramp. So when I read this, it's like, oh, he moved all the time. Yeah, I read it in the Bible, but I didn't think about it until they brought it out. <clears throat> Abraham exemplifies faith. It says right here on the <clears throat> on day one, <clears throat> April 30th. How did he exemplify faith? You said it a minute ago, Sue. Yeah, when God said leave, I mean, he was leaving everything, his possessions, his family, his prestige, his reputation. I mean, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, going to a better place. <clears throat> definitely going to a better place, one that you know, he may have uh, not done spiritually very well there, had he stayed. But the faith it took to leave everything. Mm -hmm. I moved to Elko. Joe and I moved to Elko. We don't leave anything. We drop it all with us in three trips. <laughs> we probably should have left a few things, but we didn't. Okay? He loved everything. He took his family and left. That's tremendous faith. And I had a job. I knew where I was going. Within two days, we had an apartment lined up. We knew where we were going to be. He didn't know anything. Think about that. He didn't even know where he was going, what the weather was going to be. That's a tremendous amount of faith. <clears throat> so, when you think about it, how many ups and downs do you think he went through making that decision? I'm not sure his family gave him five years or something like that. You think? Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't actually leaving everything. I think he took a lot of things with him. Well, he took his yeah. family and his sheep and whatever he right. had, but he nice. still left his family, his father, his, right. the whole thing. But think about it. How many times when... I can look back on my life and I call my dad and say, hey, I got a new job. I think I'm going to move over to Phoenix. Oh, man. You better not give up the job you got. You're getting paid every week. You got benefits. You better think really hard. You don't know anybody down there. You don't know anything. Are you sure? 
He grew up in the war. He was born in 25. He was very young in the Depression. Given up the security for the unknown. He wasn't quite as outgoing as I am. He wasn't quite as, I'll talk to anybody if I see them, but he was a good Christian. Okay? When he departed, he moved in faith. How did he move in faith? Think about this. How? I, I got notes here from when I read it. He responded patiently. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a big one for me. I promise you, my patiently doesn't happen. God's teaching me patience. Joe can tell you about it this week. Trust me. Patiently. That means he did it, he planned it, and he took off. Okay? How do you respond? How do you respond? When God, when you believe God's telling you something, how do you respond? Depends on how filled with the Spirit you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Depends how close you are, you have too. Okay, let me ask another question. How do you know if it's your impatience or the Spirit? You talk to God, you know God, you get... How do you know? How do you know you it was the same? Bible. Just going, eh, 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 come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, hurry up. You got I have a story on this one, a short story. I was in, I was living in Jim's Day Academy, dating a guy here in Elko, okay, in high school. I asked the Lord, do you want me to break up with him? The next, and I told him, I said, I need a flat in my face, written out, or whatever, so I can see it plain as day, because I'm blonde. The next day, did I get a letter from him? From Elko. So he already knows what we're going to ask him, but he provides with us the answer. Yeah, I'll buy that. You so, know, um, God doesn't have any reason to be impatient about anything, you know. Uh, now, you can feel very impressed by the Holy Spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, it's always, you have to keep focused on the Lord and, and, um, you know, it may take just constantly giving it to him. You know, you want to take it back into your own. But you just keep looking to him and believing that he's going to give you the answer. And I think that's something that we all need to work on as a church mm -hmm. family, too. How many times do we think the church needs to go this direction? Or the church needs to go that direction? Do we meet? and discuss it and pray about it before we move? Or do we just say, yeah, let's go? We should sit down and pray about it. We should, but do we? I've seen both. And I think a lot of times we don't do as much prayer and patiently waiting as we should. Okay? The other thing that was interesting out of this one is, okay, the last time God had spoken with a person... Recorded in scripture was Noah. So Abraham was now, God was speaking to Abraham basically in person. Okay? And what did he tell him? What did he tell him? All the nations of the earth will be blessed mm -hmm. through you. So I thought about that when I was studying this week. What would I do if God, Norm, what would you do if God told you that? Well, how would you feel if God said, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed by what you're doing? <laughs> oh, by the way, get up and move. Yeah. <laughs> if they could get up and move, it would be blessed. I guarantee you that. <laughs> I don't know if I could handle that. That's a big order. That's a big order. That's a lot of responsibility. Okay? Um, think about Abraham and his age. Think about his age. They don't talk about it in here, but think about his age. I don't think that that was as old as... We make it out to be back then. No, but 
it wasn't young either. I hope it wasn't, because if you lived to be three or four hundred, you had to be a little more spry at ninety or hundred than you were at forty or fifty. Right. Think about how beautiful his wife was. You know, she wasn't that far behind him. You're right. Yeah, because what happened later on in the story? He lied, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's another one too. Okay. I got a highlight here. Um, okay. It says, let me find my place here. I lost my place. The intensity of going is reflected in the repetition of the keyword go, which occurs seven times in this context. Seven times the word go appeared in this little chapter here. Abraham has first to leave his country. Okay. And go out of Babylon has a long history among the biblical prophets as we see in Isaiah and Revelation. Okay. What might God be calling you to leave behind? Everything. There's nothing that he calls us to keep here. Okay. Well, we're pilgrims, and, and he entrusts us with what we do have, but, you know, you can't hold on to any of those things, and, and you know, according to the spirit of prophecy, we are going to be leaving everything like he did, pretty much. He talks it, about the family, he talks about everything. I mean, yeah. yeah. So this came over a, a little tech, but we're on a, I don't know, what do you call it thing, Joe, we're on, where they send in all those messages. Group text? Yeah, it's a group text, but it's a uh, devotional. devotional group text, okay? Uh, let me find it here. This one hit me pretty hard this morning. It's from... Uh, While you're looking at that, I think what the brother said, leaving our past behind, that's probably one of the hardest things that we do. Right. Yeah, that's leaving your past. So, why? If it was so bad, why do we have trouble leaving it? Because it's familiar. We know how to act in that situation. We don't know how to act in some unknown situation. It's normal to us. Let me ask you a question. When I left high school, I can honestly say MBA and the Seventh Day Adventist school system did not prepare me for the real world. I had this fantasy view, even though I thought I was world, because I had friends on the outside and I did some outside work at the last part of high school, so I was in touch with the outside world. I was not prepared, so it was very easy for me to fall into the drinking and the, some of the other stuff that they did. They did not prepare me for that. That was not a familiar world for me, but I fell into it easily. Why was it hard to leave, Susan? Um, can I say something in contrast to what you just said? Mm -hmm. Only because a quote from Education, you ever read that? Mm -hmm. I've read some of it. Um, she says in there that the Bible will prepare you for anything. You know, if you take that as your guide and um, you put your faith and trust in God's word, she said you can do anything. And we don't realize the effect that the Bible has on our minds. And um, I agree. I, the Bible was always there. I always had it in my briefcase. I always had it with me. Did you read it? <laughs> no. No. But the other thing is, the point being is, back then, we were just told, you can't do that. You can't do that. God says you can't do that. There was no why. There was no, Ellen White said, that's all we ever heard. When I left high school, I didn't care if I ever heard Ellen White again. Because I got to shove down my throat saying, she said, she said, she said. It was never in the context of, she said, 
Because the Bible said, or the Bible said, look, she's backing it up. This is what's going to help you. And that's a whole other Sabbath school lesson right there. I could go on all afternoon with that one. But that's why I'm saying it was not totally prepared for what was going to happen when I went to work in the real world. Yeah, if I went to work for the conference or something else, yeah. But even at La Sierra, it didn't prepare me. I think that God was telling me to help us other people become more dependent on God. We're in a familiar situation, we start to rely on ourselves more. That's, that's what I'm saying. When I left school and I got into the real world, I wasn't familiar with it, but I came real familiar real fast, right? And that was hard to leave because it became the norm. You're exactly right. You know, it's a good point because we said it's hard to leave the past, but, um, you know, it's really hard uh, when you have negative religious experiences to mm -hmm. leave those behind. And, and that's why you just have to put all that aside and say, Lord, you know, I have the Bible here. I need to study it for myself. You need to speak to me personally through the Bible. That's what I really need. And check everything out for yourself. You know, that's our, kind of our responsibility, you know, if we're going to absolutely survive spiritually. And I will say it's hard to leave is because here it's concrete and where we're leaving to is abstract. Right. It's not something that we can fully grasp it's not something that we can fully see that's why it's called faith that's why it's called trust is because you cannot actually get a hold of it abraham never got the capabilities of seeing what he was securing he only got the promises and he adhered to those promises with tightly closed hands okay that's the reason it's hard to leave your past behind that's right you know, but God gives us tokens all along the way, doesn't he? We wake up, we have food, shelter, provision. Uh, we, we're all, we all drove here in a car, you know. Um, we have a literal Bible in our hand, you know. He, I mean, he does so much for us, and, and then we pray and he answers our prayers. So we do have, you know, a lot of things to go on that aren't completely blind. He, but that's, he shows us. All of that's concrete. What happens when we don't have any food and we have to trust God? What happens when we don't have the Bible in our hands and right. we have to know so, it? Right, it's right. abstract. It's not, it's not something that you can hold on to. So that's where faith comes in. That's, right. the, that's the key part. That's why it's so hard for people when those things come. When you don't have any food to feed your children, how hard would it be to actually secure that faith? So that brings me to the story that we had in the church newsletter about the people in your, your train. Seven cookies and, what was it? Seven cookies and uh, some water. Water, yeah. And they lasted two, and no heat. Isn't that wonderful? And the angels were singing with them, and it lasted. Thanks, John. Yeah. Yeah. It lasted. And that's, that's right, and that's fake, but, and that's why I say, when I read these, and this one's caused me to dig into the Adventist commentary a little bit, too, as we got into it, to look up some things that we wanted further explain. Joe and I were going through it, even this morning, later on. But think about that. He left the known for the unknown. He had, assumably, gathered plenty of sheep and cattle and stuff to go out on his own, but yet he left his family for a land that was unknown. The other thing I, I found interesting is the verb, or barka, for verb, blessed, appears five times in this passage. To universal blessing for all people. He was blessed. He was blessed. That didn't mean he had it easy. Why do we associate blessed with easy? that's what the world has taught us. Here's the yeah. what they call the good life, you know, and that's what you're always trying to aspire to. And then that you do serve it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> thing. Uh, you know the, the interesting part of this story to me is what they kept alluding to, but they kept skirting. Abraham's entire life is just an allegory for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He leaves Babylon, confusion, he comes into the truth, into the light, he's called by God. Once he comes out, then he goes into trials, he goes into Egypt, yeah. which is the trusting in man rather than God. Yeah. We have to learn to trust God rather than man. Yeah. Then he comes back 
And I mean, all along the way, he, he builds an altar as soon as he comes out of Babylon. You know, you get baptized as soon as you come out of confusion. Then you come back, and then you build an altar again, which is a recommitment. And I mean, it, it, all it is is just an allegory all the way along. And if you follow it, it it's, it's exactly perfect with every one of our lives and how we struggle in our relationship with God and our, in our journey to heaven. And, and even if you have the faith of Abraham, you're going to struggle. Right. And yeah. you're going to do your own. In one second, Susan. But at the bottom of the Monday, it said, what should this story teach us? Well, you just recapped it right there. But I mean, even going, when he goes into Egypt, he denies the church when he comes into trusting men. He denies the church because he's afraid of what man is going to do to him because of the church's right. association. I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal if you really compare it in that aspect. It's the same thing, Susan. And don't forget, you know, I'm jumping ahead, but don't forget Isaac, all the allegory because sacrificing your son, you know, it caused him to look forward to the son of God that was being promised, you know, and, and his lineage, you know, was going to bring that about. Right, that's why I, I, I mentioned earlier, it's hard to be at his age to be told to leave and be told that you're going to be the seed of all the nations. You don't even have a kid. That's going to lead to the seed of the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah, and this morning I had another religious station on. I have two I bounced back and forth. And the guy was doing a, a Mother's Day thing, and he tied that into um, the, the harlot with the scarlet cord yeah. and all the lineage. Yeah. And all the lineage and all that. It was, it was like, wow, I'd forgotten about all that, or I just didn't associate it with that. Uh, and Boaz, and right on down the line. You know, Paul says that. You know, we're living in the day that all the patriarchs that we're reading about now look forward to. They placed all their faith and trust in this coming Messiah, you know, and we have it. Yeah, and, and I don't know, it just, it seems hard. So on, on the temptation of Egypt, why was Egypt so tempting? Why did he go to Egypt? They, they made... They made a statement that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't believe it was right away. You're talking about a number of years because when you when you discuss Abraham's life and how old he died, there was a lot of time in between them. So there it was. wasn't right away that he went no, to Egypt. It wasn't. And like why said, did he go there? Because of a famine. A famine. The yeah. lack of the word. The the his relationship oh. with Christ became dry, and that's why he had. I mean that it's just it's like I said it goes exactly along with our with our journeys. Well, you know, Egypt offered um, they did have a river flowing by um, what's the name of that Nile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they had water, and when you have water, you've got food. But you know, he could have believed God to provide what they needed without going. Absolutely. Egypt, you know. But you know, that's the good thing about the Bible. It's and I don't know if it brings out a lesson, but. Um, the Bible brings out the truth, the good with all the mistakes, so that we can learn. You know, because he uh, he automatically ran into trouble where he was tempted to lie. You know, going back to right. Egypt, he didn't trust those people there, and the rest is history. But so I guess we've already brought up the point that we're making, like on Monday, that he had tremendous faith, he had tremendous knowledge, but he still was human. Mm -hmm. He lied. So I think, like Norm said, we need to, that's a tremendous example. The other thing I like is that you do the comparison to the lack of food in the Bible to the lack of spiritual. Well, where there's a famine, there's also a drought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the drought, you're thirsty. You're, you're looking for something more. You're, you're, yeah. you're still, he still has that drive to seek, but he's looking for, for that water that is Christ. And he went to men to find it rather than to God. And that's a mistake that a lot of us make. And Even yeah. coming to church, we were seeking after men rather than seeking we God. Are, we are. And how many, I mean, it's so easy in the world today. Listen to what people tell you rather than looking for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, Norm, let's, I'll just say, let's hope not. Let's hope that we're looking to God. Well, look at the vast, 
disparity in people and look at look at the differences. Yeah. And a lot of people are okay with just accepting what somebody says rather than looking up for themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that in the Bible well, and two, the Bible instructs them, you know, um, to search the scriptures to see whether the person is what they're saying is really biblical or not. So that is each person's responsibility. And that's how you get used to uh, that's how God gives you discernment in the future when you really, really need it. So, I found the thing I was looking for. This is why we need to have this kind of faith. Okay? This is from Ellen White's Here to Eternity, uh, 25.1. Then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul, no protection from malice and, in, and the enmity of Satan. That's what's coming. She's talking about the end times. Would you read the first part again? I didn't hear that. Oh, let me back up. I'll give you a little bit more. Okay. The Spirit of God persistently re resists, resist, I'm sorry, let me start over. The Spirit of God persistently resisted is at least withdrawn, at last withdrawn. Then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul. No protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. In the end time, God's going to look to say, and we're told this in the Bible. She's just reiterating. He's going to back away. He's going to say, I'm done. And then what happens? But that, even then, that's just a, that's this individual. Everything individual can be corporate, can be everything. But when he does that, right. the next thing we know, he's going to come. But that's the that's your that's your sin that cannot be forgiven right there. That that is when you've resisted the spirit long enough, you've withdrawn the spirit from your life, and then mm -hmm. you don't have any of that power to resist any of that stuff anymore. Right. But on the other hand, if you if you realize how precious it, it is and, and you covet to have the Holy Spirit in your life, you know, remember he said, I'll never leave or forsake you. So um, you know, and of course we're gonna experience the midnight hour when everything is darkness, but just like Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, he went all night in the darkness, you know, and he, he thought he was going to lose his life, but, yep. and that's what we're, is ahead of us, but um, he came through it, and so God has promised that we will too if we trust in him. And so I guess the, the last part of that is, what do you take away from that? That we're going to make mistakes? Yeah. Yeah. If we're repentant, we're Forgive me. Keep looking, keep searching, okay. and hold on. But what does Satan do? He'll persist he you you're, not, you're not worthy, you're not worthy, you're not worthy. Yeah, we'll agree with him. Just say, yes, I am not worthy, but Jesus Christ is. I like is that. I agree with him that I'm not worthy, but... <laughs> Jesus is. But Jesus saved me, yes. <clears throat> I never thought about it too deeply, I guess. We all know what happened to Abraham and Lot. And they got, well, wait a minute, why were we at the junction point where Abraham and Lot had to stand up on the hill and say, who goes where? Because as Abraham keeps searching for Christ, Lot is searching a little bit more for the world, and that's dividing them. You know, the enmity between my seed and, and your seed. And they were very prosperous, and they were so big that the land couldn't support both of them. Right? Well, I, 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 I would say that with God's help, yes, the land could have supported anyone. But well, the the point that I, I really see is that that Lot showed his true intentions, and that's where Abraham, because the, the, there had to have been some kind of victory. There had to have been something going on well, that was that, dividing them. Besides, it says the in land. the Bible, I think, if I remember reading it, it was says that the 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 workers were fighting over yeah. the water and the, the rights, and yeah. it, it, it turned into a mini war. Okay, and so what happened was, yeah, they had to go, and he took the easy path. But yet, I find it interesting that him and his wife and two daughters were the only ones that God was willing to pull out of there. I think that's for Abraham's. I think that was for Abraham, just the same as uh, with Job. I, it talks about 
they they were blessed for his for his righteousness. They so I mean I think that's probably uh, Abraham. Good morning, brother. Good morning. Safe Good trip. Sir. Yes, sir. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so yeah, but don't you think he was a little bit selfish when he chose? Absolutely. Selfish and selfless. Yeah, but yet he still, you know. So that's kind of he took the easiest part for himself. Ooh, we never do that. But even then, the path of righteousness is never easy. So Lot took the easy path. I mean, there, there's so many lessons here. Oh. Well, Unlike Lot, Abraham did what? What did Abraham do? Lot went the easy way. I call it the rich way. Right? Abraham was content to just follow God. And trust in the Lord, right? Yep. Trust that his needs would be met. Okay? So... Do you think, I'm just asking, do you think Abraham might have had just a little twinge of, oh man, I don't know, the scripture doesn't say, maybe, maybe not. I don't doesn't know. say, but he was human, Yes. and he did offer him first choice. On that note, if you're going a little bit beyond that, what do you think prompted Lot to look towards that way. Do you think his wife had anything to do with it? The fact that she couldn't look back, but he, or that she would look back, but he was fine with moving, looking away? <clears throat> well, that was very fertile land over that way. Very interesting. And then you had the city. You had the, I guess what we would think of today is the best of both worlds. You know, we're out here, but the city's nearby. Yeah. You know, whatever. And, and here's what makes me, that could be, the other question I have is, what does it say about when Lot moved, where did he pitch his tent? Near. He, it, yeah, it was it, he Sodom. went there in increments. In Sodom, yeah. facing the city. Right. His tent opened facing the city. That tells me, and in the Bible, and so the man was like a boss, kind of, sort of. They just didn't talk about it much, you know. <laughs> that tells me he lusted after what the city had, too. He was looking for worldly things. Yes. For heavenly things. And, okay, I got to tell you, I'm not exempt. I've applied for a few of those jobs that I wanted way back when, because only because of the money. Had nothing to do with anything else. I wanted the money. Why? Like you live the good life. Love it. Yeah. The good life. Right? Now, I never wanted a Ferrari or a Maserati or any of them high maintenance vehicles, but I always wanted a better pickup or a better motorcycle or I wanted a bigger house or more land or whatever, right? So I think Lot was in on that too. Yep. I just find it interesting, though, that even with that, I'm going to call it the lust in his heart for the worldly things. He stayed in contact with God close enough that when, and they didn't go into it here, but how evil was Sodom and Gomorrah? How evil was it? Did you yeah. hear what their names were? Right. Excuse me. Right. Yeah, I was going to, I think it's in here, but if you got it off the top of your head, go ahead. Well, I think um, Sodom meant evil and <laughs> No, it was the king's name. meant something about wickedness. It was the king's names in evil and wickedness. Yeah, on the other one they were talking about uh, in the Kelsedic, towards the end they were talking about Bershia's wickedness and all that, but I did look up Sodom and Gomorrah once upon a time and I didn't write it in here. I don't remember exactly I'd what I'd love to have a book with all the different names of Well, if you use the Strong's people, and the, meaning the Strong's the Concordance gives us a pretty good one because it takes the words from the Bible and, and let's just see if we can pull it up. Anybody know? Go ahead and speak up. I know I've done this search once before. That's what I was trying to do too. Which word are you looking for? Meaning of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Why are you looking 
that up. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to know that Abraham was content to live in the hills, it says, but Lot wanted to live on the plains. And when you're when you're talking about anything in the Bible, the upper room, the mountaintops, there that's the people are always going up to reach God. The people that were debased and were okay, they were always down lower. I think there's a really good reference to that there. I mean, again, one of them. It just people. One of them says sexual um, behavior. So either way, it was sinful. Sinful, yeah. Look at what you've done. Sinful, sexual. Yes. And it also shows where uh, Lot was at spiritually. Mm -hmm. But it also showed where Abraham was at spiritually, too. Mm -hmm. because, Absolutely. Uh, the, 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 what I like about Abraham is when he chose the, the, the outward places, you know, <clears throat> the wilderness, as we would call it. Uh, when you do that, it, it, it it's just like when God placed Adam in the garden. I'll, I'll start there. When God placed Adam in the garden, the lessons that the Lord himself taught Adam in being in the garden around the things of nature was a constant reminder of him of the lessons that God showed him. So when we place ourselves in that kind of environment, well, we're around the things of nature, then nature will speak to us in regard to God's wisdom, and it will be a constant reminder to us. You know, and, and so when we have that constant reminder, mm -hmm. we keep our mind on the things of God mm -hmm. because the scriptures tells us thou will keep you in perfect peace. His mind, mind is stayed on it. That's a good point because yeah. the people in the city and having lived in Phoenix for a little while and out in the Bay Area for a while, we see that, right? Mm -hmm. The people in the city fall, even the church people fall yeah. to the movies and the passions of the city. Mm -hmm. We're a little... Form of Babylon. It is. It is a form of Babylon. Susan? You know, and what he was saying is so true, you know, yeah, the world that offers this, this palatial wealth and you know, all these things, these glittering type things. But have you ever been in a situation where you've been really down and you needed encouragement and you're sitting there and all of a sudden a bird a bird comes and lights down closer to you than they normally would? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. You know, and you just feel like that's a blessing from God and encouragement. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing how how um you know, God views these things as very important. He sends a bird, you know. <clears throat> The world offers you the dream of whatever, you know, fill in the blank. But you know, it just shows his creative power and, and beauty and, uh, you know, uh, majesty. And you're, and like he said, it, you know, you just, you're constantly aware of that when you're out in nature. That's true. And last weekend we were, like I said, in the NBA uh, for the weekend. And so the cell phones had one bar of service, so they kind of just got thrown on the shelf while oh, they were in our pocket, they didn't do any good. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, it was. And, and there was no disruptions. And Friday at noon, we were done. The Lord really blessed us, i got to tell you. Um, that's a whole other story. But we had a totally uneventful trip. Um, he put... Thursday afternoon, he put a tire shop in our place that just solved all our worries about the trailer being ready to go because it's been sitting, you know, we lived in it for three years and actually I lived in it for five years. So it needed tires and I took them with me and they did the wheel bearings for me instead of me spending all day doing it and hardly charging anything. So we had Friday afternoon and all day Sabbath to just veg on the beach, the fog and the wind and everything else. And read the Bible. No radio, no TV. You don't get TV out there. So it was just blessings to let down. How often do we get so busy in church work and in our own work and 
of family work that we don't even take the one day of rest that God assigned us. Sure. See that just like when every year when there's camping. And and I that I learned that years ago from an old friend of mine. Uh, one of the reasons for camp meeting, <clears throat> one of the reasons for camp meeting is to pull you away from the conveniences of city mm -hmm. life. But one thing I've noticed over the years, people go to camp meeting, they take their TVs, air conditions, fans, and what you have to understand is Again, to take you away from the conveniences because when that time comes, you're not going to have air conditioned That's refrigerators true. and all of this other stuff. Remember, you're not going to have that. I remember the old yellow tents that weighed 800 yes. pounds that we had to set up there every summer. And yes. The dirt and the not getting a shower for two days. But the other thing, and some of us older, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the tent was open all night because it was. Hot. Even in SoCal, California, it was hot in yes. July, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that some of us older people remember is camp meeting was not just church people. The local people came. There were many, many, many conversions and baptisms at camp meeting or as a result of camp meeting from the public coming to our evangelistic event. Mm -hmm. If it's urgent, use the other one lock the door. Oh. No, it was, it was not. What? what? Oh. Oh. We have two bathrooms, so use whichever one you need to. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can the thing of it is, we had events that drew people in out of curiosity out of necessity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we also, even as children sliding down the hill on the cardboard and the grass and going to our little beach things with our counselors, got a spiritual rest yes. and blessing. I look back on it. In high school, I was always working. The dairy had to be in there anyway. I didn't get to do a lot of that. I missed a lot of that. But I see it happening, and I see it not happening now. Mm -hmm. People show up, like you said, in their 80-foot motorhomes or whatever, in their fifth wheels, and they plug in, and we got to have electricity and all that. And that's fine, but I also do not see, and I haven't been. Hopefully I get to go uh, this summer or one time. But I think we've lost the drawing in of the public. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get too far off, but... We have some conference leaders. How do I see this? Just say it. They're into evangelism and they want to bring it back. Yeah. But, there's always a but, right? Mm -hmm. The people, the lay people, are not understanding the passion for the development of the program because we don't have the program anymore. We have Lee Vinden and a couple others going around evangelizing our churches. Well, we're laying to see her, don't forget. I'm all, yes, and I'm all about evangelizing our churches. But I'm going to ask you a question right now. If two gentlemen or two people walked up here nicely dressed, what would be the first thought, carrying a Bible or a book, what was the first thought that would go through your mind right now? Who are they? They probably other Adventists or something, or, or they Jehovah's Jehovah Witness. I can tell you from Arizona, it would be Jehovah's Witness or Mormons. Yep. Well, exactly. Yep. And you know why? Because when they're this big, they train them. Yeah. And then they get this big, and then they get this big. So when they're this big, they're not afraid to talk to you. And our people are afraid because we didn't train them. And that's not in the lesson, but it's also in trusting God to train your youth to do the work. Uh, you know, yes, but no. I'm not afraid anymore to talk to anyone about anything. But the fact of the matter is, is I also spend more time than the average Adventist into thinking about these things and 
debating what it means. And you just I, said the I, whole word. I spent more time debating and thinking. Okay, we were we were just taught this is your Bible class. Read the Bible. Do this. Okay, next class algebra, do, 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 do. Yep. Okay. okay. You know what? It's a simple prayer, brother. You know, if all you have to do is ask the Lord, how do you want me to spread this message, Lord? Would you there you go. show me? And God will show you what He wants you to do. Yes, and we need more of that. Right. We need more of that. Go ahead. And and, and it's also um, how God works with us as well, because you know uh, we we have a tendency to view things the way we view things, and it's not necessarily how God sees it. And so we have to constantly, you know, board. What would you have me to do? You know, I, I, I never forget the, a statement Ellen White made. She said, uh, God has put a person here because of your character makeup. You're the only one that can truly witness to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. that's good. She said, she said, you know, you're the only one that can witness to them. Now, who they, who that individual may be, we may never, you know, right. I know, but God will show you, you know, uh, and and you know, it, it's it's the same way we know for everything God has, Satan has a counterfeit, yep. and so when if she says Satan tailor makes our temptations, you know, so if. If let's say you are that philosophical type of guy or woman, that thinker, well, he's going to present his temptation in a philosophical type way. You know, uh, how did he approach Christ? He came to Christ when Christ was hungry. If thou be the Son of God, commanded these stones be made bread. And so, like Ellen White said, if you think that those stones look like some jagged piece of earth, no. She said they look exactly like barley loaf. And I can imagine you have the steam coming out of it like it's fresh out of the oven because he tailor made that temptation to fit a hungry man. Absolutely. And he does that with us. He we know where our weaknesses is, we right? No. Uh -huh. Whatever your weakness and your weakness and my weakness yes. is, the Lord, sure do. the Lord, uh, or the Satan can, I'm sorry, Satan can make that. Our temptation. So, the, we're almost done here. The Babel, the Babel Coalition, I had to read this twice because it's like, what are they talking about here? Then I read it. We all know Sodom and Gomorrah. If I say Sodom and Gomorrah, what do you think of? What's the first thing you think of? Well, on that line, I, I'll never forget, uh, I think it was the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. But anyway, she talks about the evening before the destruction of the city. Mm -hmm. And it was like any other, you know, she used the word sultry. She said it was a very sultry evening. Mm -hmm. People were moving out of their homes, taking a walk through the city, doing whatever various activities that they enjoyed. And so it was it was an evening of enjoyment prior to the destruction. Isn't that amazing? They had a lot of beautiful things to look at, you know, and uh Life as usual, a same same situation environment that we're in possibly now. Yes, and it says also. What does it say? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Mm -hmm. As it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, and <laughs> so, so I think about that. But every time I mention or I see Sodom and Gomorrah, I think about Lot and the angels and the evil. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, I come up here and it talks about. I forgot that. They got in a war and got taken captive. Yep. You know, on that note, when, when um, Satan showed Christ the kingdoms of this world, mm -hmm. uh, she said that he, did, he didn't show Christ the underbelly of that life, like in Sodom and Gomorrah. They're out strolling, having a good time. Yeah. They're ignoring the, the deep wickedness that's going on. Just like we do today, we ignore it. It's like, well, we can't do anything about it, you know. Yep. But the... the, the Underbelly, which which God is going to bring down judgment on, is occurring all around us, just like it did then. So you can be very deceived and thinking life is good, you know. Absolutely. So 
as we get older, we get sick and tired of the news. We don't watch the news. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to deal with it. I know I don't turn TV on anymore hardly at all. I don't hardly watch the news. I don't listen to it on my radio because I only got six mile commute. So I don't listen. Everybody's talking about it at work. I don't pay attention. But can, I, can I say something really quick? It's because yeah. we're so used to it. We get yeah. so bombarded with everything that we're just so used to it, so we kind of... A lot of people do. A lot of yeah. people are just sick and tired of hearing it, so they turn it off. Uh -huh. They don't want to hear it. It's the same garbage every day. Uh -huh. And so we don't want to hear it. Well, there's nothing bad with turning off the garbage, you know. I, I'm the, I don't advocate looking at it, but... No. But we forget that Lot and his family was taken captive. I don't even think about that when you say Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and, and all that. I think about the destruction. And then all of a sudden it comes up here. Four armies came and took them captive. And somebody escaped and ran and told Abram, Abraham what was going on. And what did he do? He got his men together and he went and rescued them. 318 men. Servants. You notice though. The conquest was about land and about worldly endeavors. Yep. And Lot only then became involved when it became about a person, when it came about salvation for somebody. And that is really, really important for us to keep that in mind. We don't need to be getting into the wars of the world. We need to be getting in only when somebody's salvation is at stake. Absolutely. But we're in a war, all right. I we mean, are. We're definitely in a war. And But the thing of it is, I looked up on the map. We have, Joe's mom gave us the old Bible commentaries. They're old green ones that are really faded, right? But I looked at the map. He went almost 70 miles to catch him. Yep. Amazing. I can't even walk six miles to work. Much less chase somebody. And then what did he do after he caught him and he freed him? He continued chasing them so that they couldn't band together and come back and get him. But then he was offered the bribe, you know, by the kings, you know, and he said, I'm not taking At the end, yeah, he came back and the kings that he saved, the people he saved, they wanted to pay him. And, no, no, why did he say no? He said, because... I don't want anyone to attribute you're giving me anything because what I have, God has given me, and that's all I want okay. people to know. I know it's time to quit, but think about that. No, it's not. It's think about hard. that. Well, it's getting there because we never minutes. quit when I say quit. <laughs> <laughs> that's my fault. Think about this. Because of what you say? Because he didn't want... He knew it was a witness. His wealth was a witness to the world that God had blessed them. He didn't want them to say, oh, King so-and-so over here gave you. you know, All right. Exactly. How does that apply to us? Uh, well, uh, we can, you know, we're vulnerable to being bribed, too, by the world mm -hmm. in various situations. We are. You, know, you have to make those decisions as they come. And I don't care if it's the lottery. Right. I don't care if it's the gambling. I don't care if it's your job. Right. Okay. Sure, I like to get raises. I like people pat me on the back. There's nothing wrong with telling you, good job, thank you. Everybody needs a little uplifting. But when you only live for the accolades or the money that the world will give you, okay, now you're not following. This right here is an example. But I'm notice who was giving it to him. Huh? Notice who was giving it to him. Evil and wickedness. Right. Yeah. Are trying to give him things. Okay. So how many right. how many rewards in this world come from evil and wickedness? So let me let me just give you an example. Years ago, <coughs> anyway, most of you know that I was at a church in a non-denominational church in Arizona. It was the closest thing. So at the time of closing, the property was sold, and we we're trying to decide what to do with the money. Because we weren't going to take it. It had to go to other churches. But during that time, I had a financial advisor tell me, I will invest your money in non-sin investments. Because I asked him, he said, this is church money. It can't go to Coca-Cola or Budweiser or right. any of those. And he goes, I can do that and make you money until you do it. You know, provided the market stays where it is and all that. And I said, okay. So I went to the church 
board and I said, this is what we can do if we have to close it and do it. We came up with a plan before that, but he was willing to do that and he never batted an eye. But how many of our people have your investments and you don't even know where they're at and they're supporting Marlboro or Budweiser or Copenhagen. Well, there's a recording angel for every single situation like that, so they will meet with that again if they don't change their ways or reprint from us. They will meet with that again. That's a that's a given and a, and a truth. And unfortunately, these things. I'm just are, saying we hand it over to somebody else. They're making us money. We're happy with it. We're not paying attention. To or we do it ourselves. Well, I'm tithing on that money, so the Lord's being blessed, so it's okay. Really? Really? Now, here's the example. He wouldn't take a thing. Okay? And for the last five minutes, we've talked about Melchizedek in here before, in the Bible study, since I've been here. What about him? What does it say about him? He was a type of Christ. Yeah, he was like no other. No. Yes. He was Christ. like no other. And that goes along with what Norm was saying. This whole thing ties into your Christ-like relationship. The water, the food, was all supplied by Christ. He ties <clears throat> some of kills, you know, to the high priest. Right? It's also symbolic, you know, um, Christ and his priestly ministry couldn't follow the priestly ministry of man, you know, like the Levites. His had to be from a, a representative of a king and a priest. And so that's befitting. And, and it wasn't um, from the tribe of Levites. It was from Judah, you know. So that's uh, symbolic, too. And I think it, it's interesting that, that evil and wickedness wanted to give him something, but instead he gives something to the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Yeah. Right. Instead of receiving from evil and wickedness, he gives. That, 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 that tells you the type of people that are going to be saved, the people who are selfless, the people who are giving, the people who are not worried about receiving. You know, that that's, that's the key lesson here. But I also saw a note that, you know, after a salvation had been given, after he was able to save Lot, then Melchizedek shows up, and that's when he gives tithe. We, we, we don't give tithe because it's just a monetary or a physical aspect. We give tithe because we're saved. We give tithe because it reminds us of the kingdom to come, rather than this world and being focusing entirely on, on the benefits of this world and the monetary gain in this world, we give back so that we can keep our minds in heaven and focused on the, the next kingdom, right? North, yes. It, it also, tithing also helps us to battle with our own natural inheritance, selfishness. Mm -hmm. that's, exactly. And um, that's that's what tithing helped us to do, you know, battle our, our, our selfishness. And you know, and so we, we have to understand the motive also why we do it. You know, because you, know, you can do a good thing but have an evil motive behind. There you go. I, I'm um, gonna do this here. Exactly. Just take it. Exactly. Okay. And so, or or here, pull it out of my hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Or look how abundantly God has blessed me. And this is such a small token to invest into the kingdom of God. You know, this pleases God, and so that should make us happy. And we call that first fruits, right? Yeah. We give and, of our first fruits. And, and that's why, it, like Brother Norman, it has to be selfless, because the scriptures tells us the widow's might gave in less than everyone else. But look where it came from. Gave more. It came from my heart. So... In God's eyesight, she gave more than all the rest of them because Scripture tells us they gave of their abundance and they gave to be seen. Yeah. She gave it and quickly disappeared. 
And it was all she had. That was mm -hmm. all she had. Think about that. That's her last penny. That, yeah. She but, gave her last penny and slipped out the back. But the scriptures does not say, but I know what I know is that God provided her every need. Because it, yeah. it tells us um, when e Elijah went to the woman, you know, uh, uh, give me, uh, make me a, a meal, you know. And, and the, the woman said, I'm going to make the meal for me and my son, and then we're going to die. He said, well, make the meal, but give me mine first. Now, now that takes some boldness. That's just what I was thinking. You know, yeah. And especially, you're going to tell a woman that that's a mother. You know, a mother, yeah. That that takes some boldness, you know. Yeah. And she said, give, give you yours first. You got to be, you know, but she, but she said, you know what? Because you came at me so bold like this, and I believe God, I'm going to do it. And she did it, and it was accounted to her for righteousness, and never again did she run out of oil, and did she ever run out of meal. So that tells us, when we make it up in our mind to honor the Lord first, he will provide. And, uh -huh. How many of us actually can do that? Or do do it? I gotta admit, it's there's been times in my life. It's an act of faith. There's times in my life when I like I know I have to do this, but I have no idea how I'm gonna get food next week. I I'm obviously here and I'm obviously not starving to death. But well, there are times in my life when I said we have to pay. Unfortunately, I will admit <coughs> that it hurt. Well, that's that's why he says in uh, Malachi, he said, "Prove me, test me. You know, see won't I not open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing? You know, so it, it, listen when when we challenge God." Be prepared to lose. Yes, because I can also tell you that a year later, on some of those times, I was paid back. Double, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. At least that, but usually more. Double. Amen. Read it. When I pray, I ask the Lord for what I need, and then I say, okay, Lord, I'm going to wait and see how you're going to work this out. And he always works it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I'm going to close here in a minute, but I think that's something that we also lack in our churches, is our older generation, Joe's mom, my mom, Rita, I'm going to start you, older than I am, so I'm going to put my Wow. <laughs> we need those experiences shared we need that knowledge passed down. And I admit, you know what? If you're 15 and you've had that happen, you need to share it with your buddies. That's what prayer and testimony time is for. Right. Exactly. And we don't have prayer meetings on Wednesday night anymore and testimony night because we're all so busy working and, and everything. But we need it. Well, it doesn't take that long when we do come together. We can give it, you know. I was just saying, we need to do it. And maybe there's a way we can work it into Sabbath school time. I don't know. But we need to have at least one or two. We do a Friday night phone call with our moms. And we always start off with, name one thing you're blessed this week. Like the lady said, that's why testimony is so important. Because you never know who in the audience is going through. I, I've had a a great aunt that passed away about a, a week after my own mother passed away. She has been struggling with alcoholism and cigarettes for over 60 years. And when I was giving Bible studies to them, and they was on their way into the church, I never forget. Uh, she said over the years she would always try to quit drinking and smoking. But she said the devil was whispering in her ear, if you stop smoking and drinking, you're going to die. And for many years, she believed it. But when she was ready to come into the church, she said, Lord, I don't want to go down into that water, uh, a, 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 a dry center, come up a wet center with the same issues. 
So she said, I'm asking you to take this taste of alcohol and nicotine mm -hmm. from me, and instantly it was gone. The Lord don't need no 12-step program. He just do one step, and that one step is him. Yes. And when he and when she made that commitment, the Lord wiped it. She said, now I'm ready to get baptized. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when she got baptized, it wasn't long after she passed away in the Lord. In the and, Lord, yeah. Yeah, because peace. I always tell people, it's not about how you start out in life, but it's all about how you finish. Yes. And how you finish is the determining factor. Amen. Mm -hmm. Read it. What did you have? <clears throat> One time in Bonnie Lake, uh, our church that we started in Bonnie Lake, Washington, the pastor, visiting pastor, didn't show up. So we just had a praise session. People telling what they're thankful for, and things that they've been blessed with, or for answered prayer. And you know that was the best church service yes. we ever had. Well, when, when we weren't sure, when was it, Joe? Brad was supposed to preach, I guess, and he was sick. We weren't sure what was going to happen. I told Jeannie, I said, well, if it comes to it, we can do something like that. Also, we're all family here. Yeah. You know, maybe we need a family uh, get to know each other. I'm your brother. You're my sister. Maybe we need a little in your face with, you're all my brothers and sisters here. And I am here to help you. And you're here to help me. And maybe we need that little in-your-face realization because we get so busy in the everyday world. We don't think, I can't talk. Oh, I can't talk to the next. She's working too much. Or Joe's doing the book, so she's too busy. Or, you know, I couldn't get Rita on the phone, so I guess I'm just not talking to nobody. You know, we get that attitude because Satan wants us to have that attitude, man. And I think we just, that might be a good thing to bring up. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, and it also says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So, um, well, it's you know what? difficult, I'm on, you know. I'm on the schedule when, Joe? A couple weeks? Maybe we'll entertain that idea. How about it? Okay. A little testimony. Tell, just give us a two minute what the Lord has done for you. I'm going to work on that. That would be a good social. <laughs> you know, yeah, that works be. better than a sermon a lot of the times. I can yeah. see that. Well, I ran over now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the input. Thank you for all the blessings this week and last week, dear Lord. You know that everybody here has trials and tribulations, and as we go into the new week, bless us, but give us the rest today that we need in the fellowship today. In Jesus' name, amen.